Hello folks, good evening, happy Friday. Uh, my name is Ivan Salinas, I'm the programs manager here at Beyond Baroque. I wanna welcome you to the Wanda Coleman Theater and to tonight's program, it, At the Threshold, Translation and Transposition with Peter Florzig and Sarah McClay. Wanna acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongue peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to indigenous peoples through colonialism and genocidal practices. But as an arts organization, we are committed to uplifting the community's stories and cultures. To share a few words about uh, Beyond Baroque, we are a nonprofit literary arts space founded in 1968 by George Drury Smith. This building used to be the original Venice City Hall building and operated as such until the late 70s. Uh, after which Beyond Broke moved into this space, and it's now a home for poets and artists open to the community of Los Angeles. And it also makes us uh, one of the, probably the oldest organization, uh, arts organization of uh, the entire city. And we've been around for 55 years and operate with extensive programming from readings uh, featuring emerging and established authors, as well as exhibitions in the Mike Kelly Gallery, which uh, you can find in the second floor. So after the reading, feel free to check it out. We currently have the work of art artist Gila Hirsch, and there's a little bit of context in um, the wall uh, right behind the door. We are also currently accepting applications for the Linda J. Albertano Fellowship, named after a poet and performance artist uh, you can find more info about the fellowship and some of the events that we'll be hosting in April. And the fellowship is open to women and non-binary poets. Um, they are receiving also a um, an opportunity to uh, host an event at some point and also be a facilitator uh, for one of our poetry workshops uh, that happen every week on, on Zoom. Um, also for some of our programs in, in April to look out for, we are um, hosting a reading of translation with uh, Latin American poets, uh, all the way from Colombia, Puerto Rico, um, as well as uh, here in, in the US and uh, the Dominican Republic. So uh, come around to that on April 12th. Uh, it's just called Translating Latin American Poetics. Uh, we're also featuring Armenian American authors uh, with Nancy Agabian and a few others. And we're closing out with uh, the Poetry Film Festival, which will be the third edition that we're hosting this year. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be screening the live, uh, Life is a Saxophone, a documentary film on the life of Watts poet Kamal Daoud. And we'll also be screening a selection of international poetry or poem-based videos that uh, were submitted this year. So it'll be a long festival, but really fun. And um, yeah, a new way to interact with poetry in, in the 21st century. So uh, check all that out. We also have our fiction, um, our fiction workshops and poetry workshops happening every week on Zoom and some intensives. Uh, currently being facilitated by Miriam Chansey and Brendan Constantine. You can find all of this on our website. A huge thank you to our directors, to the Beyond Broke team, Quentin, Jimmy, Michelle, uh, Tech Master, Eric Alberg, uh, Pablo in the bookstore, who you can say hi to when you get a copy of Peter's books or Sarah's, 
we have some of their titles. And feel free to support our authors, support the space. I'll uh, say a bit, a little bit more about that after the reading. But um, I hope you all are ready to hear our, our poets for the evening. Um, two very wonderful poets, Friends of Beyond Baroque, uh, go way back here. So um, we'll be hearing some poetry in English, some poetry in Polish. And I'll just tell you a little bit about both of our authors and I'll let them take it away. First, we'll hear from Sarah McClay. And Sarah, uh, Sarah's fifth collection, her latest book is Nightfall Marginalia. Her poems and essays, uh, supported by a Yaro residency and a city of Los Angeles Individual Artist Fellowship, were awarded the Tampa Review Prize for Poetry and a Pushcart Special Mention, among other honors. They've appeared in Field, Plowshares, The Tupelo Quarterly, The Writer's Chronicle, The Best American Erotic Poetry, From 1800 to the Present, and Poetry International, where she served as book review editor for a decade and beyond. She currently teaches at LMU and offers workshops at Beyond Baroque, roaming between LA and her native Montana. And Peter Florzik's recent books include Swimming Pool, an object lessons title, a poetry collection from the Annals of Krakow, which is based on the testimonies of Holocaust survivors, as well as numerous volumes of translations, including Invisible, the selected poems of Jacek Goodero, which was named the Autumn 2021 Translation Choice by Poetry Book Society in the UK, and the new edition of Building the Barricade by Anna Swierczynska. He teaches global literary studies at the University of Washington and lives in Los Angeles. Uh, so please uh, give it up for Sarah McClay, and then we'll hear from Peter. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, thanks for, every, every, for coming, everybody. I'm really happy that you've been able to be here tonight. And as always, a million thanks to the team at Beyond Baroque for putting this together for us. Um, some of you know that Beyond Baroque has really become my poetry home away from home. Um, when Piot and I were thinking about how to frame and focus this reading, we knew that he was going to make translation a key focus, and it hit me that though I'm not reading translations from one language to another tonight, um, in much of the work in my most recent book, Nightfall Marginalia, there's a similar process of bringing something across, if not from language to language, perhaps from genre to genre, or through one kind of linguistic sieve or another that preserves some syntactical integrity even while words themselves change. So it reminded me of my time as a young piano student transposing. In music, as most of you will know, transposing involves moving a piece of music from one key to another while preserving all the other relationships of the notes, the timing, the phrasing, the intervals. In this case, it's the process of when I'm writing from art and in ekphrastic mode, moving from genre to genre say from visual art to the art of language, or if cinephrastic from film into poetry. In thinking about all of this further though, I wouldn't claim that my own process is quite so pure. That is, it's not just say, translating a picture into words, but I somehow weave myself into things a little more than that, so that I'm more enmeshed. My own situations and contexts and desires and dilemmas and discoveries also have a way of slipping in even if a large part of my practice is to go back and back and back to the art or the film to look again and look again and ask myself, what am I looking at? What is this? How do I say it? So now I'm not sure if transposition is as accurate a word for this as perhaps transmutation. Something is coming across from one art form to another and from one creating person to another, but the thing as a whole, as it lands in poetry, is also changing, mutating, so that I think it's both possible to trace images between the two genres and also to find the places where things diverge or bloom in one way or another. So I think 
We've often been in at least a partially similar process, Piot and I, with that enticing blur, that liminality, that place of threshold between creative beings and visions, if one can really allow oneself to be inhabited, as much as to stay alert in order to see. Tonight, um, my poems that you'll hear are inspired by a Japanese dance theater company, the image from Im some imagery from both Shane Eyre and White Sargasso Sea in what feels like a double persona poem to me, the Wilton Diptych, which is ancient, um, a painting by Tamara de Lampica, several moments in the Pavlovsky film Cold War, and a moment transmuted through an Ulipo-like exercise given by the poet Kathy Fagan Grandinetti in a workshop at the Ruskin Art Club that took years for me to complete and um, with an exploded palette of choices. The words all change, but it's the syntax that gets preserved in that one. Also, Piotr has translated one of my poems into Polish. Yeah, so I'll begin tonight by reading it and then we'll hear Piotr's Polish version. Why don't you come on up? Um, I know also some of you have been so wonderful about coming to a lot of my readings from this book. So I'm trying to, you'll notice I have a few anchors you'll know, but I'm trying to read things I haven't been reading so much um, as well. Okay. A breathing lake. Above us, floating in the dark like opened lanterns. As the water's onyx sheen closes to opaque, lotuses where stars would be, how we wanted to eat them with our eyes, how we almost did. So much closer now that we could almost pull them toward us like austere balloons. All around, our stillness, our suspension. Oddychające jezioro. Nad nami, unosząc się w ciemności, jak otwarte lampiony, gdy oneksowy blask wody zamyka się w nieprzerzuczysty. Lotosy w miejsce gwiazd. Jak bardzo chcieliśmy je zjeść oczami, jak prawie nam się to udało. Teraz tak blisko, że prawie moglibyśmy przyciągnąć je do siebie jak bezwiedne balony. Dookoła nasz spokój, nasz bezruch. Thank you. Thank you. This is the first time I've heard it. It's very exciting to me. Um, and because this next one grows directly from that sense, I think we may all have as poets, those of us who are poets here tonight, that when we write, we are translating something about our sense of the world or of a moment from life into words. Here is night text. Let's imagine I'm translating something to you. You, asleep or sleepless or naming that third place between with the tips of your tapering fingers. I don't know the language. It bends. In the mind, in that strangely shared chamber. That is, I mean, in your hands where you show me those scenes of confusion and flight with such intimacy and don't know it. Even sans color, sans liquor, sans shape, we are twins, fraternal, unknown. The moon, invasive, huge, lunging in through the windows, makes no exceptions. It's true, it will never happen. You'd be surprised. Field of Thorns. 
He could leave the front door locked for days as the grays pooled in layers, shrouding the shocking green, at least finally green after months of cold and gray and dun and smashed looking grasses and plowed fields that may or may not have been planted had sprung into lengthy choruses of emerald collaged by the deepening greens of nearly blue-black leaves as the sun was revealed for the moment as though one could glimpse a sustained chord and its deepening shadow. Always, never, there. He could leave the door locked, and he would have, had he been more nearly alone, unattended, unserved in these wrecked and exasperant seasons of water, dishevelers, unwilling to fall, these seasons that pull all the will out and force you to lie on the sheets as the bedding slides off, forgetting the pruning shears and the scythes and the clippers on the broad front steps, leaving them unused for days. He would have disheveled had he not had to resort instead to the privacy of the glass, of the liquids at hand, the burnished, the burning, the amber, the quelling capacity they still held out against all those inner expanses of gray, exposed, vast, roiling, nearly royal purple to the south, or the ore of gunmetal, the shifting steel of a school of dull knives floating together west. Walking under them, under the constantly moving and burgeoning gathering clouds, under the miles of their unpredictable rousing, looking up, disoriented, nearly falling, which would be like resting on something strangely stationary below a constantly changing ceiling, as surprising as the newly fresh smell of water on dirt, or even near dirt after days of holding back, the weight of it, the way the knuckles begin to swell, the need to pull the clouds out of the body, but to be under them was all ocean, ocean above. Walking could build the fire back, could kindle the flame inside, the flint and the friction, the little light. He could leave us for days, longer at work on the drawings, or longer alone in the work of making light behind the tapestries, of making marks on pages, finding some color, tangling the wind and the watery gray chill with the stolen dresses of childhood, the rip in the veil, the breaking slate, the buried crab, the stilled lips, the burning bird, the snow, the palms, the stones, the abundant, endless heat, the ferocity of our love for him. Kairos at night. Um, kairos comes from the Greek, and it's a word that has to do with a propitious moment for um, decision or action. Sometimes the character is associated with crisis and opportunity. It seems to be a hammer until I pick it up. On the asphalt, white on black, a broken racket at the rim says service. You hurl it in the dark, across the field, over the net. It bounces once, there are no strings, we are not even. In the darkness, clover is a constellation. After this much wet grass, my feet are so cold, they forget. You lift me to the stars, but I am heavy like a lamb. In the water, the wool gathers again its weight in river. The light does to the trees what the leaves do to the stars. Your head is in my lap. It is lighter than I thought. Your eyes, the stars, are leaving. Clover is a consolation. Take what you're given and give to whatever you take. Don't complain. I know you by the way your eyes squint through the leaves. All of them. This next poem, The Heart, begins with a, an epigraph from Sappho as translated by Carson and I to you of a white goat. 
And so I imagined the way we'd come across him there, the creature, gazing at us squarely, loosely chained. That palimpsest of horn, a singular curling pentimento, his throne, a bed of rosemary and bracken and bird lime. It will not surprise you that he caught us staring, or that this was the way he simply caught us. You will remember, I'm certain, how he wore his crown like a cuff. There was the way his hooves were split and the way he opened time. We had to notice that the sky of his neck was golden, a collar, how it blended perfectly into the metal expanse of light. Sound was the water flowing from the fountain, steady sound. Runes had fallen like petals from the roses. You will, of course, receive this, already know it. Mood rang through the moon, an oval in daylight, sinking slow. This is realism. Under the fragrant rosemary, the fog opens, closes. We live inside these hills. Hunger. This was one of those poems written during the pandemic after way too much time alone. The slip was not satin, but poppy. A linen sky gone pale and the long cascading drapes and wall, that same cool white, but the cypress, its fallen needles, the rooftops were umber, the fence, the beginning of night small invisible cries and like a wing that wooden fence grew large with shadow as its shape entered the window umber amber bulbs exposed below the flaring black shade plump with filament lit pendulous and it seemed beginning to rise as the languor of too many months without end enforced a natural languor had gathered like silk into the crack of thigh against bent knee, the seam of fleshy upper arm, crease of elbow, the mystery of triangle made by the shade of red cloth fallen high over leg, the shape the covered nipples made as the breasts splayed to balance a hand flung backward, out of sight and into foreshadowing, into the scent of the ganja filling the hallway, nearly strong as skunk, curving its way below the door and into the room through the rough hewn gap where a light crept through at night across the closed face brow held tight as scar above the nose cold eyes focused by a dust moat on the floor or the inner lip of the terracotta urn scent of sugar sweat tobacco seeping through the old pipes clinging to the pillows like a second skin galangal nights arpeggiated dawn empty newport pack on the hell strip mind like ribbons leather bangs time beyond girdle the giving up the belly abundant the giving in again 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 In the late gabardine of the trees, cadenza. One could be ravenous. One could find small bones in the chicken, find them by feel, just in time. One could desire to commemorate the one-eighth of the time spent in the company of pleasure, in the presence of desire, or the one thirty-second, or one one-hundred-thirty-second, or the one in eleven hundred or so, or the pure dark stillness of the trees in fog placed like a group of statues, just so as though their arrangement together had long been planned, not grown into, or a piece of film and the sound of a casual Stalinist's piss, also his wonder, his wandering into the tall ruins of a church. Why do I always think of Chernobyl? 
that could just as easily be the long abandoned remains of a cooling tower or a cave. But just below the cool and concrete wall, the remnants of a painted face as big as a body, one could say, I want for you to close your eyes and listen. Just listen. What I have given, what I have given up, what I would give. And the way we just seem to walk into the middle of something already happening. Incidental witnesses recording. A sweater slipped on backwards, label touching chest above the breastbone, dirt gathered around the edge of a nail, or the way skin feels when it hasn't been washed. Or the man takes off his cap as if about to look in the mirror, and it's 1949, but he meets the gaze instead of those gigantic distant eyes, translucent. And how do they do that, painted as they are on stone, of the face still visible on the wall, welcoming, dispassionate, just as a helicopter circles 60, 70 years away at the edge of a distant continent. Finally, late winter comes. We can almost feel the mud giving under the tires of the open canvas jeep in gray tones, in gray scale, as the road splits. One could walk away. One could. One could turn back. Because you sometimes swear. You say, I am fucked. You are fucked. He, she, it, they, is, are fucked. We are. Or the way Stalin's face unfurls, gigantic backdrop, facing no one, deserted trees, or near sunset, in the empty wheat field, and its single tree. And I'll end with before us. There is a mauve photographic bowl of rain though some would say a cup. A sultry plague before the fandango of alleys. An armament arm, armband tossed into the gray, the grim corvette at the rehearsal of velour and anise, ankle, anklet. A nuzzle of parched starlings sleeping like geckos, geishas, geese, just lounging, after the Sabbath of compromise, kilt, kin, kiln. I'm certain about the alleys and the alliances. I'm certain of the color of the bowl. And did I mention that huddle of parrots? Yes, five, green, clustered near the beige of the third floor windows. After the haunch of the hole, the whole dam holiday opens, and the dam spills into the castanets of the waiting hand, and it's here the maraca ticks like a rattlesnake on a short leash. I'm certain of the Geiger counter, the saber, the stomping, the sticking, and the compensation. It's worthwhile. There's a moan in the attic and one in the basement a twisting, tweaking, twerking in the den. To be clear, did I say that the bowl is the size of a valley? And did I mention the rush is the color of mauve? As the rehearsal velour deliquesces to velvet, velvet dissolving into the smooth vernacular of fur, there's a cat, a catch in the breath at the edge of the bed in the lush hush of morning. A slant, a sliver, a sip of new light in the palms. I'm certain of the armature of nothing, as I'm certain that the husk has cracked, its scraps concussed. There's a flamenco that rustles the edges of rust and of dusk and of morning, that rattles the dust from the corridors of musk. This is its cusp, as the licorice pair knows, as socks bloom into paisley stockings, as dawn's viridian muddle of leaves becomes a nest of trust, and armbands, guns, are garters, inveterate, seated deep. I'm certain of the moaning 
the anemone, the memory, the tangle, and the tango, and the glow, as I'm certain of the shade of this blueberry vermilion and of the green parrots, I am certain, certain. Thank you. That was really lovely, Sarah. So honored to be sharing the bill with you. Thank you so much. Thank you to the team here for putting this event together and to all of you for coming out. Um, I am going to give you a literary version of the mixtape and read a little bit of everything. I will begin with a short prose excerpt from this book that just came out in February, Swimming Pool, part of the Object Lesson series. Um, the uh, uh, thought behind the series is to um, uncover the hidden lives of ordinary objects. And there are five chapters in here. Uh, the first and last are memoir pieces, and in between I write about swimming and swimming pools as represented in art. So Ed Ruscha, David Hockney, for instance. Then I move on to cinema, literature, and then sociology of swimming, access, you know, who gets to swim, who gets to use municipal pools, etc. Um, but the last part is called an afterword, and it's called From Pool to Page, because in my previous life, as I like to put it, I was a serious swimmer. And many people find that transmutation quite fascinating. How did you go from being a jock to someone who writes poems and thinks about poetry and writes about other people's poetry and translates? So that's what this last chapter is about. But I thought I would start at the very beginning, which is uh, sort of how I learned how to swim. Um, the chapter, so just a couple pages from here, and then the chapter begins with an epigraph uh, in my translation from Franz Kafka's Diaries. It's a well-known quote, August 2nd, 1914, Germany has declared war on Russia. Swimming school in the afternoon. <laughs> I am sifting through memories stored on a hard drive inside my head for the first pool I ever splashed in. Was it one of the outdoor long course pools that half of my hometown frequented during summer months? Or was it something much smaller, a hotel pool, perhaps, or a pool at the resort owned by the company one of my parents worked for when I was in preschool? Company-owned resorts were a big deal in People's Republic of Poland. Though they offered basic accommodations, picture flimsy huts and a larger cinder block building where everyone took their meals. Free employee vouchers enabled countless families to go on vacation every year. When I flip through my parents' photo album with pictures taken on trips to the mountains or lakes, I see a cherubic kid raising hell with buckets and sand toys, but no swimming pool. Alas, though that's not surprising. Unlike other countries in the former Eastern Bloc, not to mention places like Iceland, which, according to one author, is one of the world's leaders in swimming pools per capita, Poland has never been known for its swimming facilities, let alone the number of them. Then, it must have been the outdoor facility I've mentioned, when the water, where the water was milky green, making it impossible to see anything beneath the surface. Its popularity stemmed, at least in part, from the fact that hardly anyone owned a car in those days, which made getting to local lakes or rivers difficult. It also represented recreation on the cheap. All that was needed was several blankets to spread out on the grassy areas adjacent to the pools, a deep one with a diving board, a shallow one plus a children's wading pool, and something to eat, usually tomato and cucumber sandwiches, a bag of pretzel sticks, and lots of sun tanning lotion. That's right, skin cancer wasn't part of the conversation back then. 
I remember jumping into the arms of my half-submerged dad or his twin brother, doggy paddling back to the wall, climbing out and doing it again, and again, and again. The pool wasn't heated, but I, like kids the world over, did not mind the cold water. In fact, it was impossible to get away from the pool. I loved, I love sliced tomato and, or cucumber on bread and chunks of watermelon to this day, but back then, I would sooner turn into a shivering prune than take a break. I don't remember if the pool, which was made of rough concrete, was divided into sections for those who knew how to swim and those who did not. But years later, in elementary school, I would visit the pool with my buddies on most summer days. What did we do? We played tag. And not just any tag, but what we called corner tag. While the person who was it treaded water, everyone else's goal was to dive or jump in and swim across the corner where the pool's two walls formed a right angle and get out of the water before being tagged. Because we didn't always play this game in a deep end, there were plenty of visits to the lifeguard stand for treatment of bloody noses or scraped knees. After 1989, which marked the end of communism in Poland, the aquatics complex would, f complex would fall into disuse along with countless similar facilities across the country, thanks to the so-called shock therapy aimed at transitioning the country from a centralized to a capitalist economy. With state funding disappearing overnight, the pools became home to ducks and geese, Eventually, the facility reopened, although with just one pool, and only to close only to close again soon after. Likely, someone else has since put some money into it, and now the place is once again open during July and August. I didn't learn how to swim there, or not exactly, but the pool near the man-made lake in Krakow gave me the first taste of how getting from point A to, point a to B in the pool can change one's life. Next I'll read a few poems from this seminal volume of poetry of witness or world literature, Anna Świerszczynska's Building the Barricade, a volume of poems in which the poet documents her experience of the 1944 Warsaw Uprising. Um, a little over 100 poems in this book. There are two pieces in the prologue and then three sections more or less corresponding to the trajectory of the, uh, of the uprising, which lasted 63 days, August 1st to September 3rd or so. Um, I'll read a couple of these poems in Polish as well. I'll also say... Um, as a preface that it's it's quite amazing to me that um, we love or admire this volume much more than people do in Poland. Um, I'm not sure why that is. I sometimes wonder if Poles, especially younger ones, are have grown tired of, of reading about their country's misfortunes and, and, and tragic history, particularly during World War II, and they don't want to read about that, and, and even in class. Uh, and it's also worth pointing out that it had taken Świerszczynska over 30 years to find the right words, the right language, diction, style to write about that experience. This is the um, opening poem from the prologue, The Last Polish Uprising. We lament the hour when it all began, when the first shot was fired. We lament the 63 days and 63 nights of battle and the hour when everything ended. When the place where a million people had lived became the emptiness of a million people. The title poem, While Building the Barricade. We were afraid building the barricade under fire. Barman, jeweler's mistress, barber, all of us cowards. 
The housemaid hit the ground holding a cobblestone, and we were very afraid. All of us, cowards. Groundskeeper, stallholder, pensioner. The pharmacist dragging the toilet door hit the ground, and we got very scared. Smuggler girl, dressmaker, tram driver. All of us, cowards. The boy from a reform school for, fell dragging a sandbag, and we got scared for real. Although no one forced us, we built the barricade under fire. A Girl Scout When she was dying in the hospital, she told her girlfriends she's ashamed that this is a war, that she is a soldier, so she is very ashamed, but asks, since she's never been to a party, that after she dies, they put on her that dress with lace. When she died, they put on her that dress, and the four of them stood at attention by her bed and stood for an hour. Harcerka. Kiedy umierała w szpitalu, powiedziała koleżankom, że się wstydzi, że jest wojna, że ona jest żołnierzem, więc się bardzo wstydzi, ale prosi. Ona nigdy nie była na zabawie, żeby ją ubrały po śmierci w tę sukienkę z koronką. Gdy umarła, ubrały ją w sukienkę i stanęły we cztery na baczność przy jej łóżku i stały godzinę. My lice. I run through the streets of corpses. I jump over corpses. On the chest, under my blouse, warm lice move. Only they and I are alive. It's what we have in common. They give me their movements in the city of corpses where nothing moves anymore. Weak like me, they want to live like I do. But when I run out of the city of corpses, when a living human opens for me the door of a living house, I'll toss into the fire the blouse with lies, which like me, wanted to live. A German officer plays Chopin. This poem may remind you of one of the final scenes in uh, The Pianist. A German officer walks through a dead city. His boots thump and so does the echo. He enters a dead house. There's no door. At the threshold he passes bodies of dead people. He walks up to a piano, strikes a key. The sound sails through broken windows out into the city. The officer sits down, plays Chopin. Niemiecki oficer gra Chopina. Niemiecki oficer idzie przez umarłe miasto, dudnią buty i echo. Wstępuje do umarłego domu. Drzwi nie ma. Mija na progu ciała umarłych ludzi. Podchodzi do fortepianu. Uderza klawisz. Dźwięk wypływa oknami bez szyb na umarłe miasto. Oficer siada. Gra Chopina. And the last poem from this book. Let them count corpses. Those who gave the first order to fight, let them now count our corpses. Let them go through the streets that are not there, through the city that is not there. Let them count for weeks, for months. Let them count our corpses till death. In 20... 17, 
I believe it was 2017, the summer of 2017, I was pursuing my uh, PhD degree at USC and I was awarded a two week long fellowship by the Center of Advanced Genocide Research to conduct research into Shoah testimonies, uh, which as many of you know, are housed at USC. And on the day I arrived and I was put in this little room with a lot of computers, it looked like a writing lab. And I was given headphones and told how to log in and, um, and begin watching and listening to these testimonies. I was overwhelmed by the sheer number of them. I think there are over 60,000 of these testimonies. And I quickly realized that what I had written in my application is that I wanted to write docu-poetry, essentially, poetry that was based on archival research. And on that first day, I was so overwhelmed with the sheer number of these testimonies that I quickly decided that to make the project really meaningful for me personally, but to actually be able to do justice to the testimonies, if you will, I needed to concentrate on testimonies that were connected to the city of Krakow, which is where I was born and raised, hence the title of this book, From the Annals of Krakow. And over those two weeks, what I did is I listened to the testimonies, I would put into the search box particular street names in Krakow, streets that I know very well, districts, buildings, uh, places that had been villages outside of the city back when the city was much smaller 80 years ago. Uh, and now those are districts of Krakow. And um, it was a life-changing experience for me because I encountered testimonies that were very specific as to the place where the, where the person found shelter uh, or vice versa, a place where the person had been sheltering, hiding, but they were denounced and had to run, go look for another place to hide, places that in many instances exist to this day, and places that I, as a local of that city, knew in a very, very different context. Uh, not that Polish kids aren't taught about the Holocaust. Um, I was, uh, but nevertheless, as an adult, it was, a, like I said, a life-changing experience for me to listen to the testimonies, what the people had experienced, and that all these things took place in the city that, um, that I call home to this day. So I'll read a couple of these poems. Most of them are untitled. Did you write them all in English? Or yeah, they're in English. Mm -hmm. And you didn't write them first in Polish? No. One. Full moon. One, two, three, and more rusted cars bursting with flesh. Cold fired engine sending smoke signals across plains. Each puff, a breath, and the sky disappearing. Da dum, da dum. The tracks have always been here. My compartment mates, keeping their eyes closed, pretend to dream. A pond, a sketched out villa that was once a hut, a barn, woods where a boy tries desperately to whistle a nursery rhyme on a blade of grass. This relic train for tourists is slow, but the arrival will be swift. These are the facts. The headlight, a scream, swallowing itself. Three. One of the first testimonies I watched at the Shoah Foundation belongs to Clara, of the black dyed hair and beaming smile. What does she see spelling the town's name with her eyes shut? Each letter, a face, a house, a meal, a tree, a bend in the road, an end. That she and her brother and parents had once shared the southern Polish city with Piotr's grandparents is a fact. Ten. 
the American poet Charles Reznikoff copied out fragments of the Nuremberg trials transcript to create his Holocaust, an arrangement of vision and horror. The tone and delivery both flat sneak up on you. The who, what, and when get answered at the expense of the why, which often gets answered with questions anyway. I've watched the testimonies. Is it evil to be inspired at the same time as horrified? The tug of war didn't end when I closed out the browser, logged off, and took off the headphones. Back home, I delved into an album of Holocaust paintings by Wilhelm Sassnall, poring over his 2003 Shoah forest piece. In heavy, deliberate brushstrokes, the primordial forest to towers over three tiny figures. The greenery a dust storm, not foliage. Taking unhurried steps, the survivor talking to Lanzmann through a translator. Beyond the frame, off to the left, the villagers talking directly to me. The book's final poem is called Second Language. It's rained for so long, I haven't left the couch in days. Feeble-hearted Chopin practices his funeral march with a small hand. My next-door neighbors, dinner time, don't mind the rain or our initials disappearing from the curb. I look in the mirror and see a pig. I read the book again backwards, but the pit of smoldering questions deepens. Years ago, in Warsaw, I went to see that heart, stowed away inside the first pillar on the left. What keeps the world from falling apart? And I will close um, with a couple new poems, originally written in English, from my new book, which I am a step away from signing a contract for. I hope the publisher doesn't back out. Uh, the book is called, uh, or the manuscript at this point is called Third Language. Um, a few years ago, I went through a stage where I was really into national anthems. And I would spend days listening via YouTube to anthems from countries all over the world and then looking up the lyrics and sort of trying to learn how different peoples uh, think of themselves and their history and also how they uh, want to be seen by the rest of the world, how they present themselves uh, because of the song, the tempo, the style, and again, the lyrics of their national anthems. It's a, it's a fascinating, fascinating experience. So this poem, it's called People's Overture, and it draws on that research. Arise, children, get dressed and eat your toast with gooseberry jam before it's too late. To arms, parents, let's march the kids back to school. Our cities may be asleep, the worms getting all the treats, but the farmers demand we act while our future giggling dangles from the gallows. Hurry, someone, for God's sake, reset the sun clock to zero zero. Years hence, no one will care if we kept our pie holes stuffed with something other than lyrics. The queen watches no TV. God saves her, toil and trouble, powdering the air, she breathes. Though the pitch teams with navish double agents looking to score a draw, our hearts rattle like baby teeth in a biscuit tin. If we had her our way, we'd scrap the past, take turns putting Scipio's helmet on and watch our Vespas morph into Ducatis. We were born hollow canolos, bounds between relatives fingered deep in dope and Chianti. Dolce Vita, God willing, will spend the rest of our days sucking on teats, or, if push comes to shove, munching, munching on kebabs rolled inside beamer food trucks off 
Venice Boulevard. Nostra Coppa, the leather pants and the Tottenkampf come out just on holidays. We're ourselves for real when we wrap our arms around a whipped horse's neck. But, ooh la la, it's the screeching night train packed with refugees from a hockey game that reminds us why, after every war, we unlock our doors. Just don't ask the man with a blower strapped to his chest about maple leaves growing far and wide, even on heads. We'll endure like the thousand-year-old bison grass vodka. We'll ford rivers, cross the Rockies, naked if we must. After 69 mazurkas, let's give Chopin another chance. I didn't, play, I didn't plan for Chopin to keep showing up <laughs> in these poems. Um, two more poems. Um, this summer marks 30 years of my living in the States. And um, I have two children, a daughter who's seven and a son who's two. And this next poem is... Um, a short poem in which I write about how, indirectly, alas, but about the fact how long it's taken me to realize what it must have been like for my parents to let their son go. <clears throat> On the anniversary of my birth. If this poem gets hijacked, smuggled across the seven seas, my parents won't be able to read it. An English dictionary? They've thumbed one once, I think. And my wife, ah, uh, the things she can do with her eyebrows instead of with Polish. Our daughter is learning the language by interpreting for her. The sounds coming out of our mouths communicate, as the poet said, before they're understood. But that's only half the truth. See, my mother and father years ago, signed on the dotted line, which is why I am here and they are there. In a way, it's a miracle that my wife and I continue to be married and that I am still my parents' son. Is that it? Hiding my face in my hands, I weep for them. <clears throat> And I'll close with this poem. Thanks again. While you were out. A font of ends was spotted between the bathtub and the toilet. Later, two more were sighted dangling from the lip of the pouting facet. History didn't repeat itself, for when Mary fed her boy an organic radish, the poor guy fell sick and kept feeling nauseous. Not much remains of the hailstorm that shook the lilacs and set off car alarms. It hurt to see Donovan lose the game in a penalty shootout. The Duns have moved out in goose-stepping fog, leaving everything behind. The first star never showed up. An altar boy, that toothless brat, was seen leaning against his bike, staring at a cow getting milked across the thistle-studded tracks. Straddling the playground fence, we cheered when the backhoes came. Then we took turns twisting the chains of the swings until someone suggested we let go. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, keep it going for Sarah and for Piotr. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So we have copies right across the hall of uh, Piotr's books and of Sarah's. Thank you both for uh, gracing us this Friday evening and to you all for being here with us. Uh, if you are interested in supporting the space of Beyond Baroque, continuing our mission to support writers and keeping our programming free, you can inquire about uh, becoming a member we offer memberships at different levels to students, seniors, um, and at the foundation level. So that gives you a bit of perks, and you are supporting 
the space and um, our mission. So please uh, support support the arts overall. Um, but uh, the authors will also be book signing if you would, would like that. Um, and yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Good, good evening. Thank you.